Hey everybody, welcome to our next session of this Ojai Ramdas Immersion Retreat. And at this retreat, I have a big treat, and it, it's <laughs> Bruce Damer, and uh, we we become friends not too long ago, but I'm so appreciate uh, that that happened. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, Raghu. And uh, uh, Bruce is a scientist, and I'm going to tell a little bit of, about it, about him, and uh, but. Um, I mean, I, we, I'd be here for 10, 15 minutes just describing all of the things that Bruce has been involved with in his life. And, uh, but then I noticed one thing, Bruce, uh, just looking up some stuff. And um, Bruce Damer, Dr. Bruce Damer collaborates with colleagues developing and testing a new model for the origin of life on Earth and in the design of spacecraft architectures to provide a viable path for expansion of human civilization beyond the Earth. That seems pretty apt right now, Bruce. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? Jeez. Yeah, knowing where we came from and where we're going, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that's a big part. That's a central, probably, uh, theme of your work. Um, so uh, one of the reasons this, is, this particular session is happening uh, is uh, I was prompted, and Bruce and I were talking about this offline, I have been, uh, for last year, Ramdas kept bringing up to me that he wanted to do a retreat around uh, science and spirituality, bringing different people together and so on, and he had some old friends that he wanted, and, you know, looking at new people. Part of this was inspired by uh, the fact that he... You know, all of, of course, the psychedelic work that he did, in, in certainly in the past and, and around Harvard, uh, and uh, the fact of where it has gone now, this beautiful moment that's happening where government uh, is allowing this testing, you know, Rick Doblin and MAPS and all those kind of people. Uh, and uh, he, they came, actually, one day to his house, maybe two years ago, not something like that, and just gathered and wanted to be with him and just sort of report about what was going on. I think he got a big inspiration there, and that, that led him to start thinking beyond just uh, psychedelics and, uh, and, and scientific uh, experimentation. So I think that was part of it. And uh, so he kept, he kept this going, and I, I said, wait a minute, you, you want to do more retreats at this stage of the game, you know? I mean, he had almost died at least three or four times, you know, in the previous uh, six, eight months or something. I mean, and I'm not being dramatic. So he he really was uh, inspired to do this. So I felt like after I met Bruce, and, and aside from everything Bruce has accomplished, uh, Bruce is close, uh, has been close to uh, Timothy Leary in terms of the work that's gone on since, uh, since Tim left. And... Uh, and loves Ram Dass and you know I mean we just hit all of the bases with uh, everything that we wanted to accomplish around this so this is our first foray into uh, in, in a Ram Dass retreat into this uh, uh, the way that the science and spirituality do come together and and of course not the least of which is the enormous work that His Holiness the Dalai Lama has has done in the last many, many years mm. and work with scientists and so on. And uh, I think that also was uh, inspirational to Ramdas, who loved his holiness. Um, we, so one of the things I did with, uh, I sent to Bruce because I found this incredible uh, talk from Ramdas. It was actually it was an interview by a, a, a physicist, a theoretical physicist, physicist named Amit Goswami, and and Ram and he interviewed Ramdas. And I sent it over to Bruce because I thought, okay, this this gives us a premise here, you know. And um, so the big thing in this was in this talk was around how do we how do we get to a shift in the paradigm of Western scientific thought? 
right? And, uh, you know, Ram Dass was always concerned about our dependence on intellectual uh, thought, that that was what we've gotten our way through, and that's what's going to get us further through uh, into, into the, you know, the next uh, centuries. And uh, so they just had a fascinating uh, talk, and, and Bruce and I talked about this uh, the other day. Um, one of the things that um, Ahmed, who is also a very, very open man, you can, I mean, by the way, this thing is available on Be Here Now Network. You can go find Ram Dass and, uh, and Ahmed Goswami. So um, th- the interesting thing that Ahmed brought up was that he said to Ram Dass, well, you know, you're a scientist. You're a scientist. You went over to India, you met Neem Karoli Baba, and then you were studying him. You gave him acid, right? Right, yeah. To see what would happen. Right. Okay, <laughs> that is like an in-person study. Yeah. And, um, and then we talked about uh, the a causality they talked about the a causality and synchronicity of these acts miraculous acts because what happened of course is well if you don't know there's plenty of stuff to listen to and read about that particular incident but basically neem karoli baba nothing happened but he was fooling with ramdas the the first time i'll just tell this briefly uh, bruce mm-hmm. uh in that he he get, he asked for what he called the medicine from ramdas and, and Ram Dass thought he meant, oh, you need some aspirin? By the way, the same thing happened with Maharaji and me with my father. That's a whole other story. But we, he finally figured it out. Oh, acid. And he, and he gave him a handful of like white lightning or something. Uh, you know, back in the day, that was the de rigueur quality of acid. And he just, he, you know, he just threw it in his mouth. Ram Dass goes home and says, Jesus, I, I mean, nothing happened. How could this man take, you know, like a couple of thousand micrograms of acid and nothing happened, you know? And then he thought, well, wait a minute. He kind of thought, I wonder if he threw those over his shoulders and I was just not looking. So he came back the second time, which is when we all went back uh, with him, uh, and not with him, but uh, around the same time. And the same thing happens. And he says, do you got any more of that medicine? Mm-hmm. And this time, Ramdas like, he puts his hand out, and Ramdas puts it in his hand, but he doesn't do anything. Maharaji then takes them one by one, sticks his tongue out, and puts it in, and he goes, am I doing it right? And, of course, again, Ramdas sit, just sat there, and, and uh, I think it was that time where Maharaji said, this is good for people for the first time to get an idea of what God is. I mean, he said, actually, he said, you can go in the room with with Christ for a few hours, but then you got to leave. Ultimately, better to feed people or something like that. Mm, mm -hmm. And so talking about it, they talked about in terms of the A A causality and synchronicity of these acts. And uh, ultimately, the human intellect has a hard time understanding a system without causality. How's that a a jumping off point for you, Bruce? Mm Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. uh, What I want to suggest is to try to find a tap root. So our our question that we're tackling today is, is there a union or an intersection between science and spirituality? Or is there a way to soften the boundaries between what can end up being kind of a a harshness, uh, a a judgment that can occur uh, of people on the more scientific, and I call them gearhead spectrum, <laughs> and the Buddha head spectrum, there can be a there can be a separation. And as Ramdas taught us, you know, separation is the the great the great tragic ripper of of civilization. That that humans should be separate from other humans. It creates a collapse within us and a hopelessness, and then it brings up all of those little inner inner beings, those inner parts sort of, that come up and are panicked about being separate. So even in large groups, even in communities, in sanghas, if you will, where one sangha feels separate or judgmental against another, it happens. So why don't we explore? Well, let's let's do an experiment and ask a question as a hypothesis, which is that, is there a common root 
uh, from which science and spiritual experience, mysticism, if you will, uh, springs. And I want to suggest that the, the starting point is that everyone is a scientist. Every little child that, that in the first month and year puts, puts everything in their mouth to taste it, to mm. see if it's okay, is doing testing. They're collecting data. They're figuring out, well, that, you know, they really don't like bitter, you know, and that they, because they tested it on dandelions outside and things like this. So we're all, we're all scientists. But what I wanted to, to clarify for the audience that in science, there's really a division between what one might call mystic scientists who are working on theory, who are working on the grand picture, the, the great uh, sizable questions. And then there are the mechanics. So the mystics and the mechanics exist in science as they do in the healing arts. Because the mechanics of the healing arts, it's all about our practices, our bodies, um, our seven sitting postures, as we learned this morning. That's mechanics, and those are that's excellent. But then there's a mystical side to the healing arts as well, which is, in a sense, awakening and awakened awareness. So it exists... This And it isn't even a dichotomy. These are partnerships. Because we can't, if we don't have mechanics, we can't open to bigger things. We can't support. We need a matrix or a, a substrate to run everything on. And we'll come back to that substrate idea a little later. But what I would like to suggest is that me brilliant mechanics in science, and many of them win Nobel Prizes, uh, do the extraordinary work that we need to solve, say, the COVID, the coronavirus. That requires so much bench work, precision, uh, analytical work, uh, culling out data, looking for the real data that you need, peer review, truth testing, in a sense. It's very, very, uh, in a sense, it's rigid, but it's also beautifully uh, self-governing, self-correcting. And we have to really thank all of those those people because those the scientists also are connected to the technologists and the technologists have to make things work like the platform we're on now so that we can get this beautiful video stream out to the world that's that was untold work by millions of people to make that happen based on scientific discoveries but then we switch over to the mystics the mystics are dreamers the mystics yeah. have all sorts of practices um, Albert Einstein, one of the famous, he has the hair for a mystic, right? <laughs> kind of like your hair there, <laughs> uh, sort of sticking up a little bit and nicely white. Um, but Albert Einstein, from when he was a teenager, did what he later called thought experiments or Gedanken Experimente, where he would go into a reverie. He would literally load into his brilliant mind all of the parts and the questions around, say, time and space. And then one day he would feel it, and he, he described it in this way. He would feel something coming through his body. This is, a, this is strange, right? This is a, an insight. It was embodied first, and then he would close his eyes, and he was in a dream. And his most famous that he's written about is that he was riding alongside a beam of light, and he mm -hmm. could watch the light compress and extend. And that dream that it was I call a delivered vision, came into Albert Einstein's systems not through reason, logic, and imagination even. It just flowed into his system. It was a mystical delivery. And that this has happened to me several times on the course of working on the origin of life. And since I was nine, I was using the system. I, I sensed that there was a bigger thing, and I came up with a name for it later called the field. It was just a field. It was just like you could you could touch the field and it could touch you and it would deliver you really cool visionary downloads it would also uh, guide you as you walked on the street so i would leave my parents house when i was 11 and do a b comparisons where i'd walk along guided by the field guided by intuition and then i would switch to a mental frame guided by kind of mechanics by by concerns and worries and things like this I would switch to that, and I would I sense a change. I didn't really get things done when I was guided by mental thought. 
magic happened when I was guided by the field and I was just being moved around like a puppet on a string. So mystic scientists do that. Uh, you have many examples. You had uh, Newton who, Isaac Newton embodied the crossover between alchemy and mysticism and spiritism and the Bible, Christianity, and the crossover between that and the calculus. And ironically, it was the plague of the 1666-1665 plague that forced Isaac Newton out of the university back home where in seclusion, in social isolation, he created some of his greatest initial work in the calculus. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, as a result of the plague. As a result of the plague. So, so what's happening now? There may be some other <laughs> yeah. incredible findings, right? So what I would suggest in this thread is that why don't we compare mystics in the spiritual side with the mystics in the scientific side and see where they meet, see where they derive their visionary experience. And of course, as a psychologist working with Tim Leary on the psilocybin project and at Harvard, they were using scientific methods and, an, and a mind-altering drug to get into a mystical state and then try to figure out where that came from as scientists. And in the sciences, if we're to solve the big problems in the future, scientists and technologists, we, we owe it to ourselves to make the mystical into an accessible technology. And I think that this is coming in our century. And it is the blending of East and West. It is the blending of, of these worlds that so beautifully uh, was embodied in Ram Dass, literally in his body, in his body of work. It was the blending of those two things, of, of Western science, uh, reductionist science, and the East, and that experience in one human being that showed us the way that Scientists can go in, can become practitioners. They can become, what did Goswami say, that the scientist uh, could become the uh, the follower, uh, right? The adherent uh, to uh, to really become do a scientific work in a practice. But then it all comes back to uh, being a human being that is, it is who is prepared and capable for the download, if you will of the mystical experience, and then the taking of that experience into the world for the benefit of, of human beings. Mm. And that if we would agree that this is a, a, a wonderful objective, then I think we can have a, a, a marriage or a con, conclave between the mystics. And this is what His Holiness has been doing, the Dalai Lama has been looking, he's been tracking that. But I think that there's a whole generation, and I can sense it in that I have a lot of young, called them millennials, uh, scientists who are going into their postdocs, they're going into careers, and I'm a mentor for quite a few of them. And they are all on, to some degree, a spiritual path, pretty yeah. much all of them. So this new crop, this new group that is coming up is very, very powerful. They have all the power and the tools of the internet. They can absorb vast amounts of knowledge, but they are also fascinated by mystical states of being. And I think that we're in the 2020s on the cusp of bringing this new generation in that is going to be able to have the capacity, all the tools, not just the analytical tools and the mechanical tools, but the access to something, the field, insights, and primarily the most important thing, their own healing. Because mm -hmm. in, in some sense, the mystic is at some level fundamentally healed all the way down. That, that's a hypothesis. Are mystics, have mystics dialed in their own healing of their own little inner processes so that they can have access? So have they healed the down here, the little painful parts that are circulating, such that they have access up here? That's a hypothesis, a question for everyone. I think that that's uh, apt, actually, uh, uh, from what I see. And we talk, I've talked about it with different people a lot on the podcast and so on. But certainly, yeah, next generation of, of uh, young folk are absolutely interested. I, I love the combination. They're interested, uh, and this isn't just around coming up through science, but just coming up in general in this world and being interested in 
doing something about the environment, doing something about the discrepancy of, of rich and poor, the polarization, all of it. There, there's a great interest, but there's also, as you just said, there's an interest in self-healing at the same time. And I, I would say that for us back late 60s, early 70s, that the, the, the of course, the, it, there was more of a, a real dissection there. There was people who were totally into social action and they were out there and they were protesting and the war, the Vietnam War and all of that. And then there was other people who were doing, okay, we're gonna go inside using psychedelics, meditation, whatever it may be, go to the East. And there, was, there wasn't there was really a blend of that where there is that now. So I, I think that that's very promising, actually, um, when you think of it and going into the future here. Uh, so one of the other things, Bruce, that, uh, that was brought up in that talk with Amit and Ramdas uh, was around nonlinear time, right? Past, present, and future exist together simultaneously. And Ramdas said, Neem Karoli Baba helped him see beyond his preconceived notions of time and space. And, and all of us that were there experienced that. You'd mm. be in that moment, and suddenly, you know, like two hours later, you'd get up and you, you didn't know where you were. You didn't know how the time had passed. You weren't thinking about yourself. <laughs> It was a, it was a, a, an incredible state of, of consciousness. So, so this I I'm just wondering because you've talked uh, we talked a little bit about um, you call it realm bending, <laughs> okay. Talk about that related to uh, the fact that you know past, present, and future. Actually, you know what the just an aside. It's a bit of an aside. But one of the um, definitions of the true guru in India uh, is called uh, antarayami. It means knower of all hearts. So that being knows all the past, all the present, and all the future of anyone that comes anywhere near him. Or they don't have to come near him, but in that it, certainly uh, this, he said, was a model for the truth, basically. Mm-hmm. Because then there is no past, present, future. There only is the now. And time and space is warped <laughs> enormously. And realm bending, is, is that, uh, are we in, in any context there? Yeah. Uh, something for the listeners to know. Uh, Catherine and I have just recently talked about that uh, some people in the culture come from a, what you call a different neurotribe. And a neurotribes is a really interesting concept because how you were born and how you're wired when you're born uh, really creates a, a capacity. It creates some kind of inner capacity. And a lot of it goes back to your, your childhood experiences, your basic experiences. Some of it's genetics. Some of it is lineage. Some of it, some of it is from your cultural lineage or things that have happened in your family over time. And you end up in these kind of neuro tribes, and I ended up in a neuro tribe uh, because I was given up at birth. So my my parents at the time were quite poor up in Canada. They, my father lost his job uh, at a filling station, and my mother worked in a flower shop. My mother just passed three days ago, so this is very oh, much. Oh my! In. Yeah, she just passed. Yeah. Um, she was pregnant with me and he lost his job and they had to, they just made the decision to give me up. So I came out into the world, into a adoption ward full of babies, you know, because in those days there wasn't birth control in 1962 and full of babies into a different container. And by the time my adoptive family came to pick me up, I'd been there about 10, 11 days and my mother looked in my eyes and said, you were in your own world. And I think that 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 experience shaped me in that, what does a little infant do if it doesn't see its mother? Well, it might see the attending nurses and get a little brief connection, but there's a lot of babies there. I I think that what I did was build myself a a nice spaceship to live in. (laughs) And there was a little part in the, in the healing work I've done. I've come all the way to the bottom to what I call my little wick 
or my little petal, the lowest part of me, the, the embryonic part where it's the first being's sense of being. And it was at the base. And I believe that what my system did was build a spaceship around that little wick to protect it. And that love had gone away. The mother's belly was no longer there. So I, my consciousness, as it was starting up, went searching for love. And it didn't know any boundaries. There, there was no boundaries. It searched the whole world for love, and then it got to know the entire planet. And so as a little kid, my consciousness was going up to the tops of the mountains. It was flying over neighborhoods constantly. It was going back through time as well. It was, it was realming. Hmm. So this is, in a way, what we might uh, term realm bending. And I was a dreamy little kid. I mean, I would go to elementary school, and I would sort of <clears throat> stay away from all the noisy kids because it, my system would be really rattled. I was uh, very one of those, one of those dreamy, realmy people. And uh, it be it was my superpower, but it was also a cage, because I was very shy and and very. They, in fact, they thought I was autistic, and there wasn't even a term for autistic. But I got sent to the nice lady with all the blocks. <laughs> Here's a and I managed to hammer a square block into a round hole. You know, they were testing me out early '70s style to see if I had a neurological issue, and they concluded I was very bright, but just very internal. And from this original conditioning. Now, what that allowed me to do is to touch a different space. And when I was talking about the field before, I had an intimate connection with that space because that's where I felt comfortable. Out in that space, in those realms. And I had to dance with it. It would give me wonderful TV. You know, before we had color TV, I would close my eyes and I would see these uh, projections starting on my closed eyelids, and they were like fractal washes. And then I would turn my consciousness down, or my thinking brain, almost completely off, and these would grow into scenes. Spacecraft, landscapes, the whole thing, and it was just wonderful. It was like better than color TV. How old were you then? I was nine when I was doing that. So. Okay. So part of the neuro tribe that, that perhaps is coming up, because I think I meet more and more young people that realm, because they're trained by this massive field thing called the internet and cyberspace. This huge new nervous system has trained their brains differently. And they can travel time and space. They can put together planetary solutions for climate change, for example. I just see it over and over. They're pre-adapted for our futures. And so this wonderful thing is happening with the, the realm benders uh, that are around. There's, there's, with every superpower, every capacity, there's, there's also a, um, I wouldn't call it a shadow, but it's a, a challenging side. And so for me, it was deep shyness, deep internal shyness that I literally had to work out 20, 25 years. I had to work to be able to, like I'm doing with you right now, to look you in the eye. It was difficult. So I was definitely on the spectrum, uh, and I had to do the work to uh, come to comfort with other beings at a fundamental level. So, and it's every day, Raghu, sometimes I undergo a collapse, and I feel my system going through dissociation and going to that safe space. And what I do is like, like we talked about before, I, I give it love. I give it, I say, it's okay. Let's let's just retract for a while. Let's let's go to that space. So, as advice for people who who feel this, give them love. There there's a little part, you know, the parts from internal family systems work. There's a little inner child that is collapsing, like I was with a, as a little baby. Give it love. It's all included. That little part that wants to collapse is welcome. We're not to exorcise them. We're not to pave them over, to put them in a closet, to ignore them. The work now is to embrace them. Embrace those the little wounded parts. And here's a viewpoint that you can take that I've learned in my work in the Luminous Awareness Institute in the last four years or so. And we have a practice in which we establish a viewpoint. And this is a re 
I would say, from uh, Ram Dass's work and many others, where we go into a state, and I'll do it a little bit now, awake awareness. You go very empty. And then coming into that awake awareness state, the empty state, the held empty space, comes an emotion. And it's perhaps one of my little parts is coming up. Because it's curious, and then I'm curious about it. I'm saying, hello, welcome. And I'll invite it right now to go to another space. And that's the space of the unification with the field, where all is well, all is taken care of, because this huge computational OS of the field that interconnects us all has already worked it all out. It is the master choreographer. It is shaping our species. It is shaping us toward health, toward survival health, clarity, and it's healing us from our deepest wounds, this, this field. And so what I do is I say, we're going to go connect to this thing called the, the field that's already figured it all out. It's going to, oh, oh, there it goes. It's lifting us. And you can come along too. You can come along too. All are included. All are welcome. And perhaps it's this kind of a practice as we nurture it that will open us to all become mystics. We can all become mystics and all all are welcome. Mm. Beautiful, Bruce. You know, I think the key word you, you just mentioned that ties this, you know, our little idea here of the union of spirituality and science is curiosity, right? We're gonna we're gonna develop some curiosity and not re, well that and that requires letting go of judgment, of course, and uh, it 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 requires a certain kind of openness to phenomena that is coming in through people, things, events, whatever it may be, nature itself, which obviously we're going through big time mm. right now. Mm. And, it, and it involves, if there's a curiosity, there's an openness, I think, to being able to meet each thing in a very uh, more, more natural way, not running away, not trying to create another scenario, not, you know, we have all of these habitual patterns where we know how to get to our safety through those patterns, but they, it's not necessarily good for us. Mm. And so some curiosity about it actually, I think, also stops the world for just a, you know, a microsecond. It's, you know, wait a minute, wonder, you know, just stops chasing after what may be in the end something that is absolutely negative in terms of f the what we do we just fend everything off fend and defend fend and defend is our fend natural propens propensity right so i i think that uh, yeah i love curiosity is uh, is so, an important word here so one of the questions we can all ask at this time and we had a wonderful visitor yesterday social distancing uh, <laughs> salon and his question was Given all the work with plant medicines that he sees uh, happening with Silicon Valley, people that are starting world-changing companies, and they come back from their experiences, and they have practices, they have sanghas, how can they bring that into business and corporations? Because business and corporation are the lever that turns the world. They are the most powerful tool we have for uh, for good and for uh, not so good sometimes. The corporation, the invention of the corporation. How can we make ones that are really deeply aware and deeply healed, where the leadership is deeply healed? And we talked for two days about this. So you come, you have a visionary download, a beautiful insight, you have your own healing, and now it's time to put it into the world. You go to your venture capital meeting about your next funding round, what if the VCs basically said, how did your healing go? <laughs> because a That's... healed 
Yeah, and a healed founder, a founder that is doing the work, is going to perform better in their portfolio. What if VCs started asking that question? What if in this, this time of COVID, so one of the great themes of this weekend, I think, is equanim equanimity. Equanimity, mm -hmm. you know, like get that pronounced right, mm -hmm. which re really means taking an equal view or a position, a neutral position that allows for all, all views to come in and to be processed and to be given a hearing. And then to maintain a very calm and centered space. And this was the message this morning of, of in the time of COVID, if we can in our practice become these calm, centered, listening to all beings, we help other people calm down, the calm, calming down of the human system worldwide, planet-wide. What if CEOs became masters of this? The CEO as Buddha. So we actually came up with something, which was that the CEOs and the leaders of business, and I know we're a little bit off topic here, but this just came up yesterday. What if they sat on the liminal ridge between magic and, and the mechanics of the world? And they, they would take input from any side. They would take input from all the craziness going on at the corporate boundary that's trying to pull their corporation toward these quick responses to things, stimulus response. Because corporations generally kind of go off track as when they stop checking in with their own culture, their own uh, equanimity, and they start reacting to the market or to analysts, things like this, and we end up with problems that actually affect all of society. What if the corporate CEOs say, we pause, we sit on this boundary, something that comes from the shadow, we take it in but we don't act immediately. We process it. Something that comes from the light, we take it in. But we, we don't act immediately. We don't reach for that because within the light can be shadow packaged, presented to business mm -hmm. leadership often. And within a, a dark a threat comes a light a teaching or a brilliant, a brilliant innovation in the marketplace, something like that. Mm -hmm. So as, as we, if we can focus a lot of our energy in the next generation, not just on scientists, but on these future business leaders, because they are going to affect daily life on the ground every single day in the way they run their organizations. And that includes their investors and includes everyone who works for them as a huge ripple effect. So I just wanted to put, put that out as something for our, our time. Yeah. yeah. Can we include politicians maybe <laughs> <laughs> i think so uh let's try <laughs> let's because, try uh, because what we uh, anyhow we won't go yeah i don't want to go that far over yeah you know because yeah. we can really go over the cliff on that one on that one all right i want to i'm going to come but i want to circle back because mm -hmm. uh, i don't think this is investigated here enough uh so far uh and that's about the uh Linear time, past, present, and future. We are here, right? We had, so this is part of what Amit Goswami and Ramdas talked about. We had this experience with this particular being, Neem Karoli Baba. Right in front of our faces, this stuff would happen that, that you only read about in books, so to speak, right? And many people... Uh, like look askance for one reason or another at any kind of miraculous event. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the possibility, probability factors, all of that. The, uh, the, the sanity of the uh, receiver perhaps is, is part of that. <laughs> right. you know, all of it, right? Um, and uh, I, I wonder how can we... I mean, they talked about it, and uh, and this thing around that we cannot accept a causality and synchronicity. What do you think? Why why is that so? I mean, to me, it's partly curiosity doesn't even you know if you don't have that at all, you you can't even address anything. But yeah, the the reality of this a a causality, uh, the and in this particular being, like people say to me. 
Well, what was he was what was he thinking when he was telling you about uh, Christ is this uh, this is how to he told me you know I asked how to meditate and he told me meditate like Christ. He was lost in love. He wasn't in pain on the cross. He was lost in love with everyone, and that's a, a whole other story. But uh, there wasn't was people. Why did he tell you that you're Jewish for one thing, right? And I'm like, I have no idea, but it's set in motion something that has gone on through my entire life in ways that I could never have expected. And there wasn't, I never thought there was somebody in there that was deciding to do anything. It was very much like a computer is the example that I give these days. And so we're, here we are. We're back, computer, science. Okay, mm-hmm. so to me, this was a thing in a body that had a wonderful personality that was was unconditional in in love and yet was just doing exactly the right thing that every individual around him needed to get free so yeah t- why are we so afraid of of this is the question you know it's um i think that uh, at one point in some of Ram Dass's teachings, there was a, uh, actually in the conversation with Amit Goswani, it was that uh, you can't know it. You can't mm. know the thing, but you can become it. So perhaps the way we collect data on this question of non-locality, we talked about Bell's theorem, on the question of how things are interconnected, on the question of how amazingly improbable things, almost miraculous things seem to be happening all the time, is to, uh, that it's it's almost like intuitively, you can't know it. If if things are coming from the the synchronous field, as uh, Carl Jung called them, there's a synchronous field where he would uh, mention the the word a red car in a seminar, be moved to turn around and see a red car drive past on the street. So he described these as improbable synchronies. Mm. And he was fascinated by this. But what I would, might suggest is that in order to collect data in that space, we have to become it. We have to merge with it and become it and embody it in order to... Uh, in order to do the data collection, because we can't break it down. We can't say, this is X and Y, and this affects this, and this affects this. Why? Because the field, because that huge synchronous field is so densely interconnected, it can't be taken down into parts. It can only be seen as a continuous flow and experienced. We, we can't take notes in a notebook. In, in Timothy Leary's archives, when I was uh, helping the trustee uh, with the archives here, and part of them are here, and a lot of Ram Dass's letters to the Crimson, the Harvard Crimson, are in mm. the collection. I sent a set, I think, over to Hawaii last year. Um, but in that uh, collection, which is now at the New York Public Library, there was a notebook with, with ruled graph paper, and it was their first psilocybin experience in Mexico. And really? writ- written in tiny little scrawled handwriting is Richard Alpert, and then the, num- the, the weight of the mushrooms taken, and then uh, literally five words as to the experience report. The, and then the same, similar for Larry T. You know, just very, very uh, academic kind of reporting. And... So they're trying in that little box to put five words to just generally summarize what happened. <laughs> and in, in a sense, okay. it's, it, it was taking very reductionist tools that are designed only for two, three variables at most and applying it to a massively complex system that is so huge that you, you can't even conceive. In fact, the times that I find myself merged into this field, into this super whatever it is, super liminal experience, I, I sometimes picture myself scrawling in a notebook trying to write the notes about this experience, and I just start laughing <laughs> because it's inconceivable. Mm. So in a sense, these are, are two magisteria. 
they're not just the magist. There isn't just the magisteria of science and spirit. There's also the magisteria of figure outable tinker toy world, and then this place. And they they cross over all the time. They're in a continuous dance, and they're both useful tools. You need to be in the tinker toy world in order to make yourself eggs. But you, but you, uh, I think more and more of us uh, long for and are entering this other magisteria and then crossing back over that liminal boundary back into Tinker Toy and then back and accepting all of it as our birthright, as the thing that is coming on that is pulling us forward. This field is opening more and more. And so that is where I think when you go and talk about time and variance and all these, so time and variance is a very uh, Tinker Toy concept, but to experience it, in all of its majesty, it's to experience all that interconnectedness can't be actually even written about in a in a sentence or even a very long peer-reviewed article, frankly. Mm -hmm. So what what my practice has been for the last really 40 years is to take that liminal journey into that space with a uh, scientific question or an engineering question and basically become the solution, become the download, the visionary download when it comes, record it as best one can mentally, and then bring it back into the me mechanical world, put it in the correct language to be tested and implemented. And it resulted in this uh, this new model for the origin of life. I'll just hold up the, that was, this was published for the public about, I don't know, three years ago, uh -huh. cover Scientific American, and it's the hot spring uh, model for life's origins. But one, what I like to to point out is that the visionary download that led to seeing the entire cycling system of protocells and combinatorial selection that was renderable down to science, where we could test it in the laboratory, in a hot spring settings with chemicals, and see protocells forming and go through selection. That we, we dialed that into a pure reductionist solution that's publishable. But when you go into the state of awe, of wonder, of this is how we may have begun in a cycling pool this way, <laughs> then the, the awe comes in, the imagination, and also heart. Because when I, when I was going after this solution for the last four decades, working with my colleague David Deemer, the last 10 years at UC Santa Cruz, I did all these dreams. And the dreams had me time travel back 4.1 billion years to a Hadean island, because I'd studied the early Earth's geology. We had actually gone to Australia uh, on two field, field trips and collected samples, and this is one of them. Hmm. This is a stromatolite from the northwest of Australia. This is time travel. This is three billion years old. This stromatolite. And these little ridges here that you can see are, are the fingerprints of microbial mats that were growing. They were stinky mats growing on a lake shore 3.3 billion years ago in Australia. And these are, this is ground truth. When you, this is grounded ground right here. This is our common ancestor. There, there were, yeah, there was an <laughs> earlier one which was the progenote, we call it the progenote, the simple mass of very fragile, fragile, uh, friable protocells cycling in these pools. And when I see the process that must have occurred to give them access to peptide synthesis, a, a proteinome, a genome, a, uh, a membrane, tougher membranes, and then photosynthesis so they could live outside the hot spring, my heart goes out. My heart gets involved because it's such an audaciously improbable event, both for the mind and it's a go team, go thing for the heart. Like <laughs> they did it somehow, right? Go team, go, you know, yeah. fragile little protocells 4 billion yeah. years ago. And, but there's a connection with the ancestors themselves through the science. And when I have that kind of connection in the heart and in the mind and in a sense of awe, my body fills with energy. I, I feel with glee because it's a realm bender's dream, right? You're, 
you get to travel 4 billion years back and you get to model the entire earth in a little pool at the chemical level with your mind. It's like playground. It's like the little <laughs> realmy kids playground. Yeah. It's a complete union. Yeah. It's a spiritual complete union with the question, the scientific question itself. And it fills me with joy. And this happened to Albert Einstein. You know, Albert Einstein was filled with joy when the solution came through his body, where general relativity was so difficult to come up with that in 1916, mm -hmm. 17. And when it came, it was this, he talked about the greatest day of my life, the greatest moment of my life. So at, at, its, at, at the peak level, beyond just the mechanics, science advances through mystical union mm. and through this connection. You know, uh, a common theme here is uh, that we, we've been talking about and you've been pointing out is around the ability for one to heal themselves and get connected with that part of ourselves that's behind all of the personality, ego, and all of that. And, uh, and suggestions, of course, that people in different realms, if they could work on themselves... This would be a prettier world that we we would be looking forward to, and then I think of you know uh, so Einstein, he's the epitome of what you're pointing to, right? No doubt about it. I I think, mm -hmm. and in fact, we talked last time we talked we you mentioned other scientists that were also uh, part of that uh, very small <laughs> uh, <laughs> tribe in terms of that um, connection with their in intuitive heart. And uh, how come that hasn't rubbed off on many more people who are in this um, profession? Well, that's our work. Uh, that is our critical and urgent work in the world. Because generally, science rewards uh, peer-reviewed publication, it rewards uh, through grants, and it re rewards through tenure. And uh, science is very conservative, and it should be. Science is, is, can be brutal. I mean, if you put forth a, uh, a, a substantial claim, you must have substantial evidence. And for me, it's super refreshing. I don't have to deal with people making stuff up because they're just not tolerated. There's a discipline, and it's almost like a wonderful, gentlemanly, gentlewomanly discipline of the Enlightenment still breathes and walks and lives in science. And it's a wonderful the discourse, the politeness for the most part, the, the deference. So it's a beautiful system. However, it tends to favor uh, specialization, deep specialization early on. So young people in their 20s and 30s getting their PhDs are very strongly discouraged for taking on big questions. It's almost like a career suicide. You mm. have to fill mm. in the dots on one particular data point and present uh, a plausible experiment, a hypothesis, test it, publish it in a peer-reviewed journal, get your PhD, and then you're given the badge for the club. If you came with a general theory of something, uh, uh, you probably couldn't even get through your PhD committee. So our young people are discouraged strongly. So they're very narrowly specialized. They're forced into these specialties. And only later in their lives, if they've won a Nobel Prize, for example, in our community, we have several Nobelists that popped out in their 50s with their Nobel Prize after 500 peer-reviewed publications. And hmm. they have groups of 30 graduate students, and they've done immense work then they have the freedom to pursue a big question. So science constricts these able and apt minds and rejects them from working on the big questions until later in their careers. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and it's a major loss for humanity because those young, supple, vibrant minds where they're growing a ton of neurons still, they can digest so much, could crack some major problems for us. And so... One of my missions in life is to, my story was that I wasn't in the main line of science. I was in computer science. So I had the dream of working on the origin of life, but I knew that that would involve 
chemistry and biophysics and planetary geology. And I only took this up full time in my late forties. Hmm. So I, I, I was very patient. I did everything along the way to prepare for this moment. And then I was able to find a way in through my mentor, David Deemer. I was able to get the training that I needed, and I finally finished the PhD at age 49. And, and my example is a way to uh, work as a realm bender, as a mystic, if you will, as a non-traditional person to to come in and work on a major problem and perhaps we don't know the the jury is still out come up with a solution that is incredibly teaching for humanity mm. but it's tough and so i think my again the mission that we ought to take up as a human species is to allow these minds to realm into the big questions allow them to develop spiritual tools that will also help them realm the big questions to uh, heal parts of themselves that may hold them back. Because, for instance, what if you have a very sensitive young person who wants to work on the big questions and she's had some, some traction, but then she gets rejected in the harsh way that can happen in science? That will hurt her deeply. And if she doesn't have the strength to sort of come back from that, or at least mentorship, or another way forward, she'll give up. And we'll lose that genius. Mm. And what a loss that would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to just, I want to round back to the field, by the way. The field, which may be another word for God, (laughs) divine presence, Mm -hmm. no mind, Buddha mind, right? Um, And I I just want to connect up a little bit with, you know, I mean, we've been talking about COVID just in reference to the times that we're in, but uh, maybe a little bit more direct in the way that uh, you talk about the field and emergent intelligence and that has within it, uh, in I, maybe my own terms, intuitive heart sense. Right? Mm. It mixes love and compassion. And... I think that this is something so important right now Mm. with all of the fear, all of the anxiety, the uncertainness. I mean, this this weekend is about uh, moving towards love in very uncertain times. And, And of course, as you mentioned before, equanimity, being able to be in a spacious moment is necessary or absolutely you're at the mercy of of some radical input from media, uh, from people around you, from being in solitude. I mean, there's so so many uh, fairly difficult uh, um, happenings that are going on in our lives right now. How do I, I want to know? We should talk about how uh, the field and and the the idea of an emergent intelligence, how we can connect with that through intuition, hmm. heart sense. And from, from there, then it seems to me we stand, uh, we have an opportunity to at least, as this incoming negative stuff uh, is happening, a way to, to, uh, uh, to turn it and not send it out in fear, but absorb it in a way that we can start to understand our own deepest shadows and 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 be able to to transform them and uh, so i i like the you know intuition intuitive heart i think that it really is very super personal it may seem ethereal and realmy and and bigger than all of us but it actually comes down to you wake up in the morning and you probably have cycling thoughts i do every day and if I glance at news and I see some of the COVID news, there's something triggers in me. There's a panic response of that it becomes very personal. Where do I run, fight or flight? Those sorts of things. So that happens. So what I what I do is say, guys, thank you for doing your job. Because a part of me is is designed by evolution to do that. If a danger is, is it, it did a good job. 
it got me into fight or flight. There's another part uh, that might have collapsed. There's another part that is, is denying. And then I say to all of them, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do some pranayama breath work right now. We're going we're gonna to breathe into the body because I know that'll calm everybody down. And you've all done great jobs. You've gotten, gotten me up. The, the fight or flight thing happened. We did some logistics. Now we're sitting. And, and if you can sit with a group, it's even better like we did this morning. And the breath work starts. And then what I do, every breath is for them. I start to sing as well. And every song is for them. I sigh. I laugh. You know, Mon Montauk Chia talks about smile inside. If you can let a smile occur on your face and then let that smile go inside, those parts think everything is somehow good again. Okay. They're like, you're okay. You're okay. And then... I do the breath work and I do mantras and sing and I sing to them for them. I hold my body. I, because I'm realmy, I escape all the time into sort of dissociation. So I hold my body. I hold my sit bones down. And when I'm done that 10 minute practice, everyone's calmed down. Whew. They're just like, Whew. oh, thank goodness. Everyone's calmed down. Now we start the day again. Now we start the day again. And what has happened in that process is intuition has kicked in. Hmm. So that problem I had with the reviewing of this paper where they're changing the editors and that said, oh, that's the solution. I just, I just add myself to the paper and support the young student. A, a, a tricky academic problem was resolved because I did this practice. So I quickly take care of that. And now suddenly I'm freed because that was going to take hours to figure out. Then I walk out into nature. And, and I'm out in nature... I might, and we, we might, uh, because we're so close, we're so intimately stuck at home and we're stuck looking at each other, maybe sit with your partner. Your partner's nature too. <laughs> Look in the eyes of the other human being. That human being represents the natural world, represents the power of the, cre of the creation of evolution, the power of all. Looking in the eyes of another is looking into the cosmos itself. And you'll learn so much. And then then after that type of a practice, you could sit in a bit of meditation by yourself, maybe looking out over a valley or some kind of a view, getting fresh air, and say, Dear Field, whoever you are, whatever name I give you, or no name at all, can you give some insight as to what is happening? And I've, I've done this several times. And the vision that I got back was a visionary kind of download. Usually it's not a, a word or anything like that. I got the vision of a comb running through hair, someone's hair, or even the comb on an animal, on a big super animal. And the comb kept coming. And this, this, this came to me about three weeks ago as COVID was really coming up. And I asked, what is this? And... The answer was, this is a loving application of a gentle touch of combing out some of the loose hairs, waking up the being, because it's too much stress. So the earth system is under massive stress, mm. and this gentle combing action is just waking us up and, and taking a few of us, you know, and we'll miss them, and, and, and it's a terrible experience to have your loved one dying in the hospital and no one can, you can't say goodbye, it's just terrible. I'm not belittling that. But the, but the message that came was this combing, this first one, this first virus, this first virus of the 21st century, this first pandemic is gentle. It's, it's not as harsh as the 1919 Spanish flu mm. or bubonic plague or Ebola. We, were, we have been spared the worst. And it is teaching, it is a great teacher. It is a great teacher for humanity. And so what you see, suddenly there's no like vastly reduced air pollution, vastly reduced consumption, vastly increased uh, people in living in a different way, not triggered really, not triggered in the sense that they're driving to work. They're, they're, they're working, people are working to exhaustion all over the world in this culture working up to a breaking point, and some people go past that breaking point. I did. 
In fact, I think I passed that breaking point around February 15th, and I collapsed. Mm. I'd just been doing too much. And when COVID came, it was like the gentle calm saying, now, before you completely blow up your system, you must rest. Everyone must rest. And I think of it as an intelligence. Now, I may be pilloried for this, but I think there's a there's a, a spectacular probabilistic timing of this thing. Here we have 19, no, 2020. If this had happened in 1995, we wouldn't have had the nervous system of the internet. We wouldn't have been able to share information so rapidly to help save so many lives. We probably would have lost hundreds of millions more not having this wired new nervous system. All the practices, all the foods, all the ways to order products and get them, all the ways to communicate good and bad, we have the nervous system just in time for an event like this mm. to strengthen that nervous system. And I think that this is Darwinian natural selection, good old-fashioned reductionist Darwinian natural selection acting at a species level. And what it is doing, it is, it is, it is shaping us for our future survival. It is culling out some of the unnecessary and some of the destructive, and it is allowing us to make the choice to be better as as human beings and better in running our world and watch what happens when our world is taken off the pressure of all these humans just temporarily. Look at the clear yeah, skies. It's amazing. You know, amazing. Amazing. Oh my God. So it's, that, it's, yeah. Per, perhaps that's that's my download on, on the yeah, COVID nineteen. Very great. Yeah. Um you know, we're we're getting close to the end of our session. But you showed me a picture the other day that a friend of yours, I believe, had painted. Um, what's what's the background a little bit? And we're gonna we're gonna show everybody and uh, you guys uh, out there in uh, digital land. If you can put that picture up, and Bruce will uh, talk about it a little bit because it's. Uh, I mean, probably would take a lot more than the the ten minutes we have. But <laughs> right. <laughs> but. Uh, Go ahead and put that up if you can, Jr. Um, but you might as well go ahead and talk about it and let us know. Yeah. So, in my work, my my practice is to come up with reductionist, uh, mechanistic, almost the, I call them gearhead solutions. That, in in this case, and what's shown in this image, is the origin of life. How did life cycle from the background of physics? and be lifted into existence uh, against uh, a non-living world. Using the the bits and pieces of non-living matter, it became living matter. And what is this transition? But what happened about two years ago was I thought I was done. I thought I was absolutely complete with this work. We'd published our major papers. The science, the empirical evidence was coming in. And I thought I was done. And then I sat down one night at... Uh, Moss Beach in California. All, all mm. great things come while sitting on a beach in California. And <laughs> uh, the, the sun was setting. The sun was going down. And I asked the question. I said to the universe, the universe was coming out. The stars were coming out through the setting sun. You could just see them coming out. And so I just went into mystical. I, I said in, into question, into curiosity. I said to this emerging universe... We are so rare. We are so rare. Four billion years, we got to this point. We're intelligent. We use tools. If you look at all the things that happened that could have knocked us off, the asteroid impact, the too much volcanism, the wobble in an orbit, the gamma ray burst, mm. not having the, the eukaryotic cell form so that it could then use the oxygen and produce more oxygen, produce plants to create a breathable atmosphere, to create the the background for big animals like us. You know, the big asteroid that whacked the dinosaurs and left prosimians so that we could evolve and radiate. It's so freaking improbable mm -hmm. that, that we are here at all. So I called to the universe and said, hey, pay attention. Can someone out there, or some, or the totality, at least acknowledge that we are here? And then what appeared in my third eye, if you will, 
was this spire that was pointing straight up. And it was a living sculpture of the entire process from the origin of life. And you can see that if, 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 if is, is it on screen? Do we know if it's on screen? Yeah, it's on screen. It's yeah. on screen. Okay. Yeah, we just you, can't see it. But, you see the yeah. little hot spring, like the little uh, geyser going off. That's the cycling system that charged up and made the polymers that got into protocells that then went under underwent this huge roulette wheel to find the ones that had any function and pull them out and put them into the next round. And that roulette wheel led to that great big flat base that you can see, which is the microbial world, the still the dominant world on this planet by, by mass. Most things are microbes, and we're just microbe-carrying machines. But then what happened was the cycling of the sun, and you can see that spiral, put high-quality energy into the system on a daily basis and drove the system away from equilibrium, evolving it. It's that single process of the sun rising every morning that stacked all the innovations and evolution through the microbial world. And you'll notice in that spire, there's little blobs then appearing. And those blobs are the beginnings of larger cells and, and animals and more complexity. And, and yet the spire is even thinner because it's more fragile, it's more friable. And the spirals continue of the, the sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, driving, driving, driving. And then what I saw in the spire was this eye. And the eye was self-awareness. The mm -hmm. birth of self-awareness and cetaceans probably first, tens of millions of years ago. Self-awareness where that the organisms said, we're here. That's me. You know, I can see my own reflection. <laughs> that's me. You know, orangutans can do it. I think... I think parrots can do it. I mean, goodness gracious. Um, and then you get to this interesting state where the cycling becomes more intense. And the cycling, you'll see there, we're in this neck. We're in this neck of intense cycling where the system is driving evolution faster and harder and harder and harder toward a new point. And that's the point that has the big explosion, the big starburst. And that's what I was shown in this vision. And that starburst links all the way back down to the origins. You'll notice that it's all connected. And that that was the realization of us, where we came from, how rare we are. The heart connection, the heart intuitive connection of, oh my God, we are so improbable. And look okay. at the little ones that struggled to create our atmosphere, the ones that struggled through the progenian to actually birth life in this improbable way, and here we are, and you get this whoom that comes in, a realization of this totality of what is, all in one thing. Now you'll notice this little tendrils in, in the middle part of it. Those are what you could call Indra's net, or the net of being, the thing that connects it all. Hmm. And I think we found chemically how that starts with chemical messaging in, in the first protocells. And we found, we're predicting, that the entire net of being, the entire field itself, is made up out of a giant matrix of probability shaping, memory reading and writing on a continuous basis, and interconnected message passing. Because we see this in our science, and in, in the protocellular level, in the lab and in the field. We see this model emerge. So the prediction, the hypothesis that we can come up, come up with from reductionist science is that we have a potential way to explain all of this. And it, the field is much larger than humans, much larger than a human brain. It is the totality of all of nature through all time. And it's the substrate upon which this field runs. And we can talk to it like it's an operating system. We can mm -hmm. ask it for help, and it will, will actually arrange probabilistic events for us. Mm -hmm. And that's another part of my work is to bring perhaps this, these tools and techniques of, of an intention where you have a dream, attention for the little signs, <clears throat> signs that are sent to you, like what <clears throat> drew you to India, you know, you, and then action, the going to India. So the intention of I'm, I'm on this path, the, the uh, action that comes of going to India shapes your probability, your probabilistic field in your life, and that this is a sort of surfing that we all do. 
and that the field itself is a huge probability shaping machine. It's a miracle machine. And that perhaps Maharaji was, <laughs> was in complete union with this field. And therefore, every intention the man had for others' well-being from the heart, from the pure th heart, manifested in the field as realization and action that just happened on a continuous basis, perhaps. I needed you back then to explain that to me, Bruce, because <laughs> I didn't know what the hell was going on. Not that I do now, but uh, I do through the heart and understand that well. Uh, that's so beautiful. That God, I haven't had a dream like that. That wasn't a dream. That was during the daytime, right? It was at dusk, yeah, just sitting on the beach. Oh, God, you're something. Um, so uh, we're we're getting towards the uh, the end of the session. I, I just wanted to. I found something because just circling all the way back to the union of science and spirituality. Um, this it may be not a direct hit, but in terms of uh, what I feel is uh, uh, an underlying theme here, which is you know returning to healing our self. In any field that we are in, if we have that, then whatever it is that we have, as you said, the intention to do, it will stand a large chance of being really a useful offering, no matter what it is, in the smallest or largest way. So this is from Joseph Goldstein, who's a, a good friend and a teacher. Joseph is uh, one of the three Amigos who brought uh, Vipassana back, Sharon Salzberg, Joseph, and Jack Cornfield. He said, the art of practice is the creative aspect. The science of practice is the lawful aspect. And he then talked about, what are we talking about when we talk about lawful? We're talking about dharma which is the truth of things is the most simplest, is the simplest uh, definition. But just this came to me, you know, the way the art is, is the creative aspect. It's, it's the, 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 the intention for us to go into the deepest, the mystical part of ourselves. And then the science is, is the relationship we have with understanding our role and our place in life. And the combination of these things is, uh, is a way for us to get at the truth. And I'll I have would, to ask Joseph <laughs> if he had any intention with any of that that I just said, and, but I, I like it. And to put to some icing on his cupcake. Yeah. I see it, and I see it cupcake, in your... Yeah. That's right. I see it in your face. I think the most important... Uh, in a sense, body and mind and soul and heart framing is humor mm. for all this. And if you look at Maharaji, you look at Ram Dass, you look at mm. Raghu Marcus, you look at you know this one here behind the mic, Albert Einstein, Francis Crick, all these people, because they had touched that world, there was levity, there was there was humor, there was a lightness to it because mm. the lightness opens those gates and softens our seriousness and yeah, our efforting. Yeah. And I think that that's, uh, in a sense, to go, to go out with yeah. it's, its laughter, levity, and in the yeah. heart and in the mind and relaxes us all into yeah. what is possible. Absolutely. Ji ha, as they say in Hindi. Uh, bilku, for sure, for sure. Bilku, yeah. yeah. Bilku, <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, uh, in this film that we did, Becoming Nobody, uh, featuring Ramdas, which is out there now, uh, he says in it, to me, the most, the essence, and you just said it, but I'm repeating it again. He said, what we need is love and humor. He just out and out said that, you know, and this is from an interview that he, the, the director did a few years ago. Thank you so much, Bruce, God, to hang out with you. we got to do a hell of a lot more. I mean, I beseech Bruce in every instance to come along and, and, uh, and join us, and I'm, I'm really happy that you did. 
And uh, the, we will be doing these again, so look out for Bruce and Namaste. Namaste. <laughs>